Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. With Skillshare, you can find inspiration in the moment and learn how to express your creativity. Bring color and beauty and fun into your year. Learn to paint with watercolors, develop a new logo for your business, or express your personal style through interior design. I recently went through Everyday Flowers, simple, stunning arrangements for any occasion, a Skillshare original from Spencer Falls. I love flowers, but don't normally keep them in my home because my cat likes to knock over vases. While I may not get a lot of use out of the skills I picked up from the class, I enjoyed it, and that is what is important. Because this class is included in my Skillshare membership, I was able to take an hour to just listen to an expert discuss a topic I have an interest in and enjoy beautiful floral imagery without giving up my access to the other pragmatic courses that I can take with Skillshare. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes, so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. With an annual subscription, Skillshare is less than $10 a month. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so that you can explore your creativity. Thank you. Nancy Mitchell and her husband Joe were the managers of the Beach Motor Inn near Lake Ontario in Hamilton, Ontario. On the evening of October 17th, 1990, Joe was flipping through the channels on his television at the motel, eventually stopping on a channel showing a program he had never seen before called Unsolved Mysteries. A photograph of a woman appeared on the screen, and Joe was shocked when he realized that he recognized her. He called Nancy over, and she could immediately identify the woman as well, without any prompting from Joe. Then a picture of a man appeared on the screen, and the Mitchells recognized him as well, as he was the man who was staying with the woman whose picture they had just recognized. The couple was wanted by police, according to the program. They had checked into the motel as Mr. and Mrs. Fred Smith, and had been staying in room 12 of the motel since September 10th. Nancy and Joe were not particularly fond of them, despite the fact that they very rarely left their room. Personally, I didn't like them. There was something about them, Nancy would later tell the Baltimore Evening Sun. Joe had difficulty getting them to pay for their room each week, and they were a week behind on their payments. Nancy and Joe called the authorities immediately, and an emergency response team was quickly dispatched to the motel. When they entered room 12, however, no one was there, and the room had apparently been abandoned. Witnesses were quickly located, who reported seeing the couple getting into a taxi. After contacting local taxi services, Authorities located a driver who reported taking the couple to the Red Rose Motel, roughly six miles away. The couple was apprehended by authorities at their room there at 3.20 a.m. on October 18th, just hours after Joe and Nancy Mitchell saw them on television, during the first broadcast of the episode of Unsolved Mysteries that featured them. They did not know that they had been on the show, and said that the timing of their departure from the Beach Motor Inn had been purely coincidental. It may have had something to do with the $140 they owed the motel. The couple was 46-year-old Sandra K. Beeman and 30-year-old Edgar Eugene Kearns. They were wanted by police because Edgar had recently escaped from Allegheny County Jail in Cumberland, Maryland, where he had been one of just two maximum security prisoners, and K. Beeman had been a correctional officer. K. was a former beautician who had worked at the jail since 1980 and worked the midnight to 8 a.m. shift. On August 29, 1990, at 2.27 a.m., Edgar Kearns had entered the office where correctional officer Michelle Puderbaugh had been reviewing medical charts. There were two other guards on shift with her at the time. One of them had gone out for the shift's nightly snack run at a nearby convenience store, and the other, Kay Beeman, was out on patrol, making the routine inmate verification. Edgar had a hard object inside of a sock in his hand, and Michelle feared it was a weapon. He told her she would be coming with him, but she was able to run into a nearby employee bathroom and lock the door. She soon heard a series of noises at the door controls that indicated that someone had left the jail. One inmate had not been in his cell at the time because he had been allowed to study for his upcoming GED exam at a counter near where Michelle had been stationed. 
He knocked on the bathroom door and let Michelle know that he had seen Edgar and his cellmate, James Barnes, leave the prison. He also said that they had taken Kay Beeman with them and that James's arm had been around her neck, as though she was being taken against her will. Michelle immediately notified the sheriff's office of the escape. While it was initially assumed that Kay Beeman had been taken by the two escaping prisoners as a hostage, it quickly became obvious that she had actually participated in the escape. Kay called her 21-year-old daughter shortly after the escape, telling her that she was safe and that she was with one of the escaped inmates. The theory would be confirmed on September 2nd, four days after the escape, when James Barnes was apprehended in his hometown in West Virginia. He informed authorities that Kay had in fact aided in the escape. She had smuggled hacksaw blades into the facility so that the two prisoners could exit their cell by sawing through the bars, but when this did not work, Kay had to let them out of the cell using her keys. James also told authorities that Kay had participated in the escape because she was in a romantic relationship with Edgar Kearns. This would not be the first relationship Kay had with an inmate. By her own admission, she had previously dated two men she met while they were being held at the jail. She had also been set to marry a man she met while he was an inmate just four days before the escape. Kay had first met 33-year-old Thomas Bowman while he was being held in the Allegheny County Jail in 1989 on a breaking and entering charge and developed a romantic relationship with him. He was transferred to the Maryland Correctional Institution at Hagerstown that November, but Kay wrote letters to him and visited him there twice a week without fail. They planned to marry on August 25, 1990. Kay obtained a copy of Thomas's birth certificate so they could be issued a marriage license and purchased their wedding bands, while Thomas made arrangements for a minister and with the prison for the ceremony. However, Kay never showed up for her wedding. It took some time for Thomas to get a hold of her over the phone, but when he finally did, she told him that she no longer wanted to have anything to do with him. She would claim after her arrest that she had only agreed to marry Thomas out of sympathy. I loved this woman, Thomas would later tell the Baltimore Sun. This had been the first woman who stuck by me. She met me in jail and stuck with me. I still love her, and that's the worst part about it. According to her friends and family, Kay had been greatly unhappy with her life. While Kay had no criminal record, at least one of her friends was unsurprised that the chronically unhappy Kay had seized an opportunity to run away and leave everything she had behind. Kay was divorced and lived with her two adult children, neither of whom she got along with, in a mobile home. She struggled to stay current on her bills and was resentful of the sheriff's office, with which she worked closely. Just before the escape, Kay told a friend that it would not be long before she was free. The friend did not understand what she meant until she heard about the prison break. Authorities in Canada had Kay and Edgar deported, and they were driven from Buffalo, New York, back to Maryland. According to the officers who made the drive with them, the couple did appear to genuinely have feelings for one another, and they laughed and giggled for most of the drive. Kay and Edgar appeared in district court on October 30th, and were as physically affectionate as they could be, given their restraints, in front of the waiting reporters, kissing several times for the cameras. In an interview with the Cumberland Times News, Kay claimed that she and Edgar were working to obtain a marriage license, and that they were hoping to have a child together. Given the fact that neither of them had any qualms about running away, both Kay and Edgar were denied bail. Following a bail review hearing, Kay was granted bail, but it was set at half a million dollars, which she could not post. Kay was initially held at her former place of employment, but was transferred to another facility to avoid making her former co-workers uncomfortable. James Barnes was sentenced to eight years for the escape and related charges, which he will not begin serving until after he completes a 50-year prison term in Virginia for rape and kidnapping. Edgar Kearns was sentenced to six years for the charges he faced in Allegheny County for writing bad checks, and faced similar charges in Virginia, in addition to the charges that stemmed from the escape. He had previously been charged with the attempted murder and kidnapping of his former girlfriend and her daughter, but those charges were dropped when the girlfriend decided not to testify. Kay Beeman entered an Alford plea to the charges against her on March 27, 1991, and sentenced to 10 years, with half of that sentence to be suspended. Subsequent airings of Unsolved Mysteries state in an update that after they were both released from custody, 
Kay and Edgar lived together until Kay's death in 2002, but no mention of Edgar is made in her obituary. Kay passed away on January 23, 2002, following a long illness at a hospital in Ocala, Florida, where she had moved a year earlier to live with her sister. Eight-year-old Mariah Martinez was the oldest of three children. She and her siblings lived with their mother, 27-year-old Amanda Martinez, in Lubbock, Texas. On October 6, 2016, Mariah's brother, five-year-old Jeremiah, spoke with Child Protective Services while he was at school. He told the social worker that his mother had gotten into an argument with her boyfriend, who had then punched Jeremiah in the nose. Jeremiah also reported that the boyfriend had threatened to kill Jeremiah and his entire family by driving them into a pond. CPS was further concerned when Jeremiah told them that his family had been living with his 45-year-old maternal grandfather, who was a registered sex offender, with a 2002 conviction for aggravated sexual assault. On October 17th, the school contacted CPS again because both Mariah and Jeremiah had not been in school in a week. That same day, their mother, Amanda, was given a drug test and tested positive for methamphetamine. The Texas Department of Family and Protective Services obtained a court order removing Mariah, Jeremiah, and their two-year-old sister, Leahmiah, from their parents' custody and placing them in the custody of the state. However, when officials from CPS went to enforce the order and collect the children at their home, they and their mother, Amanda, were gone. Law enforcement was notified, and missing persons reports were filled out on the three children. Amanda Martinez was located and arrested on November 1st. She told authorities that her children were with an uncle in New Mexico, but investigators who followed up on the statement found that they were not. Amanda was released. On November 30th, the state of Texas issued a KPS calling for the arrest of both Amanda and her mother, 44-year-old Deanna Martinez, each on a charge of interference with child custody, a state felony. Investigators believed that Deanna, who had her own history with CPS, stemming from a 2006 investigation, helped take and hide the children in violation of their court-approved custody orders. She was arrested in Albuquerque, where she lived, and transferred to the Lubbock County Detention Center on December 30th. Amanda Martinez would remain free for a few more weeks. On January 17th, 2017, Police received a report that Amanda had returned to Lubbock and had dropped off her children at the home of one of her relatives in the 8900 block of University Avenue. Officers arrived on the scene and placed Amanda under arrest for the interference with child custody charge. Both Jeremiah and Leahmiah were found in the home, but Mariah was not there. Amanda refused to tell authorities where Mariah was, what had happened to her, or why she was no longer with her brother and sister. In April, Amanda pled no contest to the felony charge and was prohibited from having contact with her children for three years. She further was subjected to a curfew, had to perform 120 hours of community service, could not patronize any establishment that sold alcohol, agree to DNA testing, and attend substance abuse treatment. Since Mariah's mother would not help locate her, authorities turned to the community for help. On March 23, 2018, Mariah's case was featured in a segment on the A&E show Live PD. The segment featured Angeline Hartman from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Pictures of Mariah and the details surrounding her disappearance were featured, and while Mariah went missing from Texas, viewers were advised that her family also had ties in New Mexico. It would be this connection to New Mexico that would ultimately help find Mariah. After seeing Mariah's story on the show, a viewer who recognized her called in a tip reporting a sighting of her in Albuquerque. The New Mexico State Police began following up on the information provided by the person who called in the tip, conducting several interviews and surveillance as a part of their investigation. On Monday night, March 26th, just three days after her story was featured on television, Mariah was located at an apartment in Albuquerque. It appeared she had been taken care of during the time she was missing. The now nine-year-old was placed in the care of the New Mexico Children, Youth, and Families Department. The apartment where Mariah was found belonged to members of her extended family. They were aware that Mariah had been reported missing, but opted not to report her whereabouts to authorities. 
The New Mexico State Police did not charge them with any offense related to interference with the custody order in place in Texas. They did perform a follow-up investigation that did not reveal any signs of abuse or neglect of Mariah while she was with these relatives. The fact that she is in good health is a relief to the people who hear about these stories. New Mexico State Police Lieutenant Elizabeth Armijo said after Mariah was located, This is the whole point of having segments on these kids and putting faces on the news. There are success stories.